this film was produced to aid projectionists and describes the proper use and essential care of the Bell & Howell film -O sound projector. The operation of all the film -O sound models is practically the same. With the projector placed on the projector stand opposite the screen, the two doors on the right side should be opened. Remove the power cord, feed reel arm, take up reel arm, and empty reel. Insert the feed reel arm into its socket at the top front of the projector case. Then insert the take-up reel arm into its socket. The take-up reel arm gears should be disengaged. Loop the two spring belts over the pulleys of both feed reel arm and take-up reel arm. Be sure that the belts are not twisted. The mounted 8-inch speaker can be played in the case. or can be removed from the projector case and placed on top of a table or a chair near the screen. Unwind the speaker cable and insert its jack into the socket of the amplifier panel marked single. With both power line and lamp switches off, the power cord may be plugged into the projector receptacle and a 110 volt AC wall socket. Open the small door in front of the projector lens, then turn the clutch control clockwise as far as possible. When the power line and lamp switches are turned on, a beam of light is projected onto the screen. The light image may be focused by rotating the lens. The image may be centered by adjusting the tilt knob at the front of the projector. Moving the projector forward or backward may be necessary to fill the screen with the image. Turn the lamp switch off and the power line switch off. Now place a reel of film on the front reel arm and press it onto the spindle until it locks in position. Place a take up reel on the rear arm spindle. To begin threading a film, first unwind about four feet of film. Slip it through the slot in the top of the projector case and pass it over the film roller. Then pass the film under the feed sprocket. The film will engage the sprocket teeth when the guard tab is pressed. Swing the gate lever upward to open the film gate. Place the film in the aperture channel and form the upper film loop by following the raised loop guide. Press the gate lever down to close the film gate. The lower film loop should also conform to the raised loop guide. The film is carried over the take-up sprocket. Lock the film. Next, pass the film under the upper stabilizer roller, around and under the sound drum, and under the lower stabilizer roller. The film is locked in the sound sprocket so that it fits snugly around the sound drum. Pass the film under the snubber roller, under the rear guide roller, and through the rear slot. Then, the end of the film should be passed under and around the bottom of the take-up reel. By turning the clutch control counterclockwise, the hand setting knob may be used to test for proper threading. Return the clutch control to an extreme clockwise position. When showing sound films, turn on the amplifier switch. Make sure the forward reverse switch is in the forward position and that the sound silent switch is in the sound position. Turn the power line switch on, then the lamp switch on. Focus the picture by turning the lens. Then tighten the lens lock screw. Set the volume control and adjust the tone control. The framer knob can be adjusted to eliminate any frame lines that may appear. If the picture has advanced too far, you can reverse the motion of the projector. First, turn the volume control down. Stop the film by turning the clutch control counterclockwise. Turn the power line switch off. Set the forward reverse switch to the reverse position. 
turn the power line switch on. Turn the clutch control clockwise, and now the projector is operating in reverse. For forward movement, turn the clutch control counterclockwise, turn the power line switch off, set the forward reverse switch to the forward position, turn the power line switch on, the clutch control clockwise, then the volume control up. When the picture has ended, turn the lamp switch off and the sound volume down. The remaining leader should completely pass through the projector before the power line switch is turned off. To rewind the film, first interchange the positions of the two reels. Press the take-up lock lever in. Raise the spindle to engage the rewind gears. Lead the film from the full to the empty reel. Turn on the power line switch. Turn off the switch when all the film has been rewound. To show silent films, the sound silent switch should be at the silent position, and the amplifier switch should be off. Otherwise, the projection procedure is the same. We have seen how to operate the Bell & Howell projector. Let's now learn what care and cleaning should be given the projector. Pull out the projection lens and clean it with lens tissue when dusting. The condensers may be cleaned in a similar fashion. The film gate shoe should be cleaned before each showing. Pull it straight out by grasping the metal frame. The aperture and film channel may be cleaned by using a small cleaning brush. Only a clean, soft cloth should be used to wipe the highly polished film gate shoe. When the projector lamp is burned out, replace it by first turning off both lamp and power line switches, disconnect the power cord from the projector, Unscrew the cap at the bottom of the lamp house. The lamp will drop out. Insert the new lamp with the vertical tongue of the pre-alignment gauge toward the front of the projector. When the lamp settles in its proper position, replace the screw cap tightly. If the exciter lamp needs replacement, unscrew the thumb nut of the compartment cover. Press the lamp down and turn it counterclockwise. Put in a new lamp, reversing the procedure just followed. After wiping the lamp clean, replace the compartment cover. If the fuse needs replacement, first be sure the power cord is disconnected. To remove the fuse holder, turn it counterclockwise. Put in a new one ampere fuse and return the fuse holder by pressing it in and turning it clockwise. For proper lubrication, you should consult your instruction book. For repair beyond the material covered by this film, report to your supervisor. With proper care and operation, 
your Bell and Howell projector will give you years of outstanding service. Oh, film just broke. <laughs> it literally just... Yeah. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to our lunchtime AV Geeks uh, streaming show. Uh, it gives me great joy to show you a film about film. A uh, 16 millimeter film about 16 millimeter film projectors. The meta part of it is really quite quite great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we uh, show old 16 millimeter films and um, to your delight and horror and uh, have been doing this. This is our 196th show. That was our 830th film that we've shown. Although, give or take on those numbers. Excuse me. Um, this next film is a film for unwed mothers and teenagers who are having premarital sex. It's called Lucy. Pregnant. I'm only 16 years old and I'm going to have a baby. It all started when I met Joe. each other right away. After I met him, I didn't even look at another boy. He was my guy. most of the time. After a while, I did too, so I could be with him. I didn't know it then, but that was our first mistake.
Then one day, I found out I was pregnant. When I told Joe, he didn't want to believe it. And neither did I. But I guess we shouldn't have been surprised. My God, that was stupid. I blamed stupid. him and he blamed me. We were both so scared, we started yelling and screaming at each other. As if that would help. Can't help me to shut up and I was so uptight, I got mad if anyone even looked at me. I hated everybody, and I thought everybody hated me. It got so I couldn't stand to stay in the house or see anyone. Not even Joe. I wanted to go hide somewhere. I almost went out of my mind. I'm in trouble. A girl I knew even told me how to arrange for an abortion. But I couldn't do it. Maybe someone else could, but I just couldn't. I threw the address away. Mom figured things out. At first, she yelled at me. Then she started crying. That made me feel even worse. Why didn't you tell me? You didn't have to hide it. What's going on? She's crazy. When my father Why found out, he called me a no-good tramp. If Mom hadn't stopped him, he would have beat me up good. After a while, he calmed down. I guess he figured we were all stuck with it. I was in trouble, and I needed help. An old friend of Mom's told us about a social service agency that helps girls like me. We decided to go see them. Your name is? Lucy Watts. Well, Lucy, my name is Miss Wiggins. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to be... At the agency, they talked to me about what I would do next. Like, they wanted to know if Joe and I had thought about getting married. Poor Joe. I knew he loved me, but how could he take care of a family? He didn't have a job, and he hadn't even finished school. Then the lady sent me to the prenatal clinic for medical tests. Mom went with me. The test showed that I really was pregnant. I went back to the agency and they asked if Joe would come in with me. I told Joe I'd gone to the agency. He got pretty nervous when I said they wanted him to come with me next time. But at last he said he would. I'm awfully glad you decided to come in and see me, Joe. I want you to know that you Joe told the lady he was looking for a job now and he promised to finish school. He didn't try to cop out or anything. I was so proud of him for that. Then she asked us if we had thought about what we would do with the baby. 
I could keep him myself to raise, put him up for adoption, or put him in a foster home until I made up my mind. But I had to decide. Wow. Up till then, I'd only been worried about myself. I never even thought about what would happen to the kid. It hit me hard. My baby was a person, too. Joe told me he would try to help all he could. But we both knew that wouldn't be much. Things would never really be the same for either of us now. I started taking typing lessons. I knew I would have to earn a living, no matter what I decided to do about the baby. At the clinic, I learned things about my own body that I didn't know before. I wish I had known. Maybe all this wouldn't be happening to me now. I'm going to spend the next half hour on an informal talk about what will be happening to you over the next six weeks. Now, let me begin by giving a very quick outline. They told us all about the pill, rubbers, the diaphragm, and other ways to prevent pregnancy until you're ready for it. And these were facts, not stories or dirty jokes like I'd heard from my friends. To bring up any problems that you would like a personal answer to. I've done a lot of thinking. Like how different my life would have been if this hadn't happened. If only Joe and I hadn't been so dumb. And I think about what life will be like for my kid. I can already feel its life beginning inside me. Maybe I'll keep my baby, but I know it won't be easy. I sure hope my kid sister will learn something from this. And not the hard way like I had to. It's not the end of the world, I guess. But it sure is different from the way I wanted things to be. So that was Lucy. Um, I don't know the year on that. I, you know, it's 70s, definitely. Um, but it may be early 70s, but I'm, I'm not sure. There wasn't a year associated with it, and the research I did hasn't really brought up. Because it's a one, one word title, it's harder to kind of drill down. What's interesting is there's another film I have called Phoebe that came out in 1964. Same premise. But at the end, she gets shipped away. She's pregnant and gets shipped away to a home for unwed mothers. So there's definitely a shift in that 10-year period. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I have lots of films about... I have a film called Me, A Teen Father, um, and other films, uh, that one So You Want to Dance, um, that all kind of address this issue, which is that horny teenagers make babies um, and have to figure out a way to deal with them. So, yeah, happens. All right. Um, <clears throat> if you guys are liking what you're seeing, uh, please feel free to subscribe or follow or like or, I don't know, whatever platform you're watching, click on it and share this with your friends. Also, you can buy me coffee. Um, thank you so much. I got a lot of great uh, coffee 
donations over the last two days because of my birthday. So thank you for that. Uh, also, you can go to avgeeks.com and see other stuff that I got online. I got lots of stuff. This next film is a complete shift <laughs> in who <coughs> the target audience is. This is a military training film. And it's about safeguarding uh, military information if you've been captured uh, by the enemy. Or if you're in a situation where you could be uh, revealing information to people that are eavesdropping. So here's safeguarding military information. <laughs> And the last time I told you one, you told your mother, and your mother told me that you told her the secret I told you not to tell me. I mean, well, what difference does it make? We can't go to the beach tomorrow, and that's final. I can't tell you why. No, no, I haven't been demoted. I'm still a general, like I told you. But honey, it's regulations. But I tell you, it is regulations. You mean it's that Ferguson girl? I saw you making up to her. You didn't pull any wool over my eyes. All right, go ahead, take her to the beach. But you'll get a nice surprise when you see her in a bathing suit. She's built like a bicycle. I don't care how she's built. I don't care about anybody but you. You know that. It's just that, well, we're sailing for Hawaii tonight. 
I said we're sailing for Hawaii tonight at 10.30. So you see, honey, that's why I can't take you to the beach tomorrow. Yes, I can't take you to the beach for some time to come. I sure will be thinking about you. Hope you miss me a little bit. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> but honey, I tell you, I'm sailing for Hawaii on the SS Navajo at 10.30. Oh, thank you. Hawaii, on the SS Navajo, at 10... I'd sure like to be there with you. Hope the fishing is good and you're catching some big ones. Must be pretty cold at night, though. Say, when you wrap up in that old Navajo blanket about 10.30 tonight, and you're sitting there in front of a big blazing fire, I hope you'll remember those balmy nights we spent on the beach in Hawaii. This is one of the latest type aircraft detectors. They are capable of detecting the sound of planes miles away. They can make unwanted sounds or select others at the will of the operator. And yet, no one would compare their efficiency to the thousands of unauthorized ears that are listening everywhere, day and night, for secret military plans. A thoughtless, talkative person can destroy months of careful planning and endanger the security of the nation. For this reason, Military personnel and civilian employees must not discuss military instructions, plans, operations, movements, composition, or the location of troops, casualties, morale, equipment, or supply, results of sabotage or of air action or of gunfire, or any other military subject in the presence or hearing of any stranger, either military or civilian. Military personnel, civilian employees of the War Department, and employees of commercial firms engaged in projects for the War Department all share this responsibility in common. Military men must be on their guard, particularly where servicemen congregate or they are bound to attract persons gathering information relative to the armed forces. Say, that guy must be the champion bowler of your outfit if he can shoot like he can bowl. Yeah, he's good, all right. They tell me you've got some new anti-aircraft guns that'll knock them out of the sky like they would play pigeons right out of the factory. I don't know about that. It's not in my line. Back in a minute. I'm going to okay. get a drink. The proper way to deal with the situation is to report the matter to the commanding officer without delay. He will take whatever steps are necessary. Under no circumstances must a soldier appoint himself a one-man police force. members of the military service must know that those who seek to impress others with their importance by giving unnecessary information, and those who feel that they must tell their friends and families all they know, may be a menace to their country and the lives of their comrades. Good morning. Will that be all? Yes. Oh, I must telephone my husband right away. I just got a letter from George. Oh, uh, your son George. How's he doing in the Army? Wonderfully. Oh, his father will be so proud. Listen, I've just been selected with several others of the best men of my company as a special guard to transport a secret piece of military equipment to San Francisco. 
train leaves tonight at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Isn't that fine? George is a great boy. Be sure and send him my best wishes. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Wait a minute. Rewrite. Go ahead. Tear down one and two. Hold three for pictures. Great as it is, personal tragedy is not the full cost of a careless word. A slip of the tongue may mean the difference between victory and defeat. A person charged with safeguarding secret or confidential matter will exercise every precaution to prevent unauthorized persons from learning of its existence, its whereabouts, or contents. He will disclose the information only to those whose duties absolutely require that they have such information. Merely because a person is a friend or a relative does not entitle one entrusted with safeguarding military information to even mention the subject of that person. It is impossible to overestimate the importance of safeguarding classified military information. The Espionage Act, designed to help safeguard the security of the nation, is strictly enforced. It provides heavy penalties for violations of the regulations for safeguarding military information. Remember, careless acts cannot be undone, nor thoughtless words recalled. Think before you speak. I love films from that time period. It has a lot of uh, character actors, Hollywood character actors that show up. Um, and it's pretty great. Um, let's watch... Uh, some PSAs about seatbelts. My babies take some hard licks out there, but I have a law that helps keep them free of injury. Nobody goes on this field without proper safety equipment. Right, Coach! Here's another one of my babies. I take care of him with a child restraint system. Protect your baby. Use a child restraint system. This is a dummy in the front seat of a car going 30 miles an hour. Watch what happens when the car stops. Now the dummy's wearing a lap belt. And now, with lap and shoulder belts. See the difference? We thought these films might help you decide what to do the next time you get in your car. Well, we know safety belts are a real headache, but look at it this way. Your headache could be a lot worse. Some people believe it's better to get thrown clear in a car crash. But at 30 miles per hour, that's the speed you will be doing when you hit the concrete, or a lighting pole, or maybe you're just lying there, stunned in the road. No, the best place to be in a car crash is in the car, with your safety belts buckled to hold you there. If you're not wearing a safety belt, what's holding you back? When you're traveling along the road in your car at 30 miles per hour and you crash, you crash around too and you get hurt by the steering wheel or the windshield. But if you wear safety belts, they restrain your movement inside the car and reduce your chances of serious injury by 70%. Think about it. If you're not wearing a safety belt, what's holding you back?
So that pumpkin one, um, I wonder how many takes they had to get to actually hit that telephone pole because I have chunked a, a, a pumpkin and uh, it's not easy. Aiming is not easy. So to get it to go like that is must have been several outtakes to get to that point. Um, also, I don't know if you noticed, like the egg yolk was greenish and the pumpkin was greenish. That was an early color correction attempt where I had to adjust the hue and so that she hues everything else off because those films were beet red. All right. Um, let's see what we got coming up here. Oh yeah, this is a Cornette film. Um, this is not one of the new films that I got. What I've discovered is a lot of those films in that, that giant batch that I've encountered thus far are, they're all, it's all raw footage. There's no sound. They're not actual prints. Uh, so at some point I'm, I'll probably start hitting like actual film prints that have sound and all that stuff and I'll start showing those. But right now it's, it's a lot of really poorly spliced raw material they look really pretty but they they won't run through this machine they basically the splices just pop off so it's it just doesn't work but uh yeah but i you know i have been sharing some of the stuff that i've run across that i have scanned on other machines and so usually that's when you see the countdown at the beginning or footage at the beginning of our show that's from some of the footage that i found uh that beautiful footage it's the, the person threading the projector and um, the little kid um, so anyways, here's our living constitution. It's a good farm. I've lived here all my life. So did my father and my grandfather. This land has been in the old family for almost a hundred years. That's why I didn't take very kindly to the Ira County Airport. But you did sell the land, didn't you? You want the whole story of the airport for that school paper of yours, you'll be obliged to let me tell it in my own way. Of course, Mr. Owen. Only I... Now, your story started... Write this down. The story started about two years ago in this very room. That's when the leaders of this civic committee, Mr. Asini... They were bound and determined that Green County was going to have an airport. And they had gone out and picked 300 acres of my land they wanted me to sell. <laughs> well, I took to the idea about as well as a chicken takes to water. I'm not obliged to sell. And nobody's going to make me sell. By gum, I'll stand on my constitutional rights. You know, just saying that made me think. Do I really know what my constitutional rights are? Do I really know what the Constitution is? But the Constitution dates back to 1787. What's it have to do with the airport? I said you'd be obliged to hear this the way I want to tell it. Besides, you'll be surprised how our Constitution, old as it is, fits in with your story in the airport. That's how I came to get a copy and put it up there where Aunt Millie's painting used to hang. I guess you know what the written Constitution looks like. First, there's the preamble. We the people. And, well, you know. Then Article 1 sets up a Congress, the legislative branch of our federal government. Sure. And Article 2 provides for the executive branch. And Article 3 for the judicial branch. We've studied that. Those three articles define our federal government. Now, but remember, the federal government was established by the states getting together and delegating certain powers to it. Other powers they reserved to themselves. So we have Article 4, which deals with the relation of the states. So there we have a federal system with both central and state governments. And both of them are limited in their powers. But, from there on out, the Constitution has done a lot of growing. Article 5, which provides for amending the Constitution, shows that the men who wrote it expected it to change. Take a look at the amendments. I know. The first ten are called the Bill of Rights. That's where I get those constitutional rights I was standing on. According to the Fifth Amendment, my property couldn't be taken away from me without due process of law. Not even for an airport, see? 
I told you this is part of your airport story. But the Civic Committee had their constitutional rights, too. Under the First Amendment, they staged a couple of mass meetings to stir up interest in their project for a county airport. So the issue was put to a vote as a referendum question on the ballot for the next county election. Before the election, there was a lot of campaigning, especially by the women of the Civic Committee. Time was in this country when only men could vote. But when the people decided that women should vote too, they up and changed the Constitution to suit themselves. Yeah, that's one of the later amendments. Then again, sometimes we the people change our minds. In 1919, we wrote prohibition into the Constitution. In 1933, we wrote it out, which goes to show that when all was said and done, the Constitution at any time is what the people want it to be at that time. But about the airport referendum, when the votes were counted, a while ago you asked how a document written in 1787 could have anything to do with an airport. Well, son, you've got to stop thinking about the Constitution as just a written document changed only by written amendments. For instance, you know that the written Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. Yes, sir. Well, back in the early days of our republic, Commerce had to do with horse-drawn vehicles and boats. But times have changed, and so has the Constitution. It's been changed through interpretation of the word commerce to include trains and trucks and buses and, as I said, airplanes. It's changed enough so that under the Constitution, Congress created a special agency to control commerce of the air. And you'll be interested to know it was this agency that the members of the Civic Committee consulted about choosing the site for the airport and laying it out and getting federal aid and financing it. Anyhow, that shows you how the Constitution changes to keep up with the times without anything new being written into it. Well, take the Department of Agriculture, for instance, and some of its agencies. They give us farmers a lot of help. But do you think the Department of Agriculture is provided for in the written Constitution? No, sir. It was created by act of Congress. That's right. Through interpretation of its constitutional powers, Congress has created a flock of departments, agencies, bureaus, and commissions, and passed hundreds of laws. And when you come right down to it, all these are additional parts of our Constitution. Now then the executive department of our government is also forever changing the Constitution and adding to it by interpreting the present. And our Supreme Court and the lower courts decide hundreds of cases every day. These decisions are especially important in interpreting and modifying the Constitution. Finally, you come back to we the people. We have the last say as to what our Constitution will be. But speaking of courts, Mr. Owen, didn't you end up in some sort of a court battle over um, taking your land for the airport? Not exactly, but you're one step ahead of me. I told you about the referendum question getting on the ballot. Well, <laughs> it stirred up quite a rumpus. Both major political parties made an issue of the airport. There's an example of still another way the Constitution changes, through custom and usage. The written Constitution says nothing about political parties, not even a mention. But just the same, political parties have come to be an essential part of the way our system of government operates. And the same is true of the President's cabinet. It grew out of custom and usage. Well, I wasn't very pleased at the way the election was shaping up. And I was a lot less pleased of the way it turned out. The news came to me along with another visit from the Civic Committee. They asked whether now I was ready to sell my land. My answer was still no. They said this was too big a matter to be blocked by stubborn, selfish interest. Stubborn, they called it, for a man to want to hold on to what was rightfully his. Then they told me mine was the only land the Civil Aeronautics Administration would approve. If I wouldn't sell, they'd have my property condemned for the public good. That night, I took advantage of my right of free speech. I wrote a letter to the editor of the Star, my good friend, Dick Bradford. I appreciate your position, John. Of course, I'll better in the next issue. But, in the same issue, I'm going to run this letter. 
It's addressed to the people of Greene County from the president of Federal Airlines. Our company has followed with keen interest the progress you have made toward establishment of a county airport. For some time, as you know, we have planned to use the airport to provide passenger and cargo service for the people in the area. The farmers in particular would profit through the opening up to them of new markets for their produce. But now it appears that one of your farmers is so lacking in vision that by his stubbornness he will delay the airport project indefinitely. But it isn't stubbornness, Dick, it's just... I'm only reading this. The loss to the people of Greene County can easily amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But that is not our concern. Now, inasmuch as we have been approached by your neighbors in Montgomery County... Montgomery County? We plan to lend them our support in the establishment of an airport, which... Operator. Operator. Uh, Harriet, uh, get me the president of the uh, 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 Federal Airlines. Well, how do I know? New York or Chicago or someplace? You see, it was for the good of the majority. And I got a fair price for my land, too. And I've still got my house and enough land on this side of the highway to keep me busy. Come here, Frank. Mm -hmm. There's one of the big birds, a real thoroughbred. Just think, more than a hundred years ago, my grandfather plowed that land with a team of oxen. That's progress. And a hundred years out of airplane is old-fashioned, our country will still be thriving under our living constitution. It's a great film. So to keep that film from rolling, I had to put my finger, uh, keep it so that it was lying flat because it, it's beginning to vinegar and warp. So it wouldn't make a, a clean contact with a um, little sprocket, sprocketed wheel that measures the where the um, frame is. So I had to put my finger on it and keep it on there. So you can see there's a little bit of dirt film dirt on my finger um it's what we do it's not just hit and play and record we got to actually uh physically do things and that is the secret tool of a uh telecine operator is like well that doesn't work that doesn't work you know what i'm just gonna put my figure there <laughs> and uh, keep it going um i've mentioned that to other post houses and they've all kind of had this little sheepish grin about uh doing that so it's pretty funny uh let's see what do we want to see what do we want to see we're almost done uh let's learn about lsd and narcotics the hallucinogens are drugs whose primary effects are on the mind so they are frequently called psychedelic they include mescaline and psilocybin. The best known is lysergic acid diethylamide, derived from a fungus that grows on rye grain. Pure LSD is very powerful. One ounce is enough for 300,000 average doses. Extensive experimentation has failed to establish a medical use for LSD, but study continues and the legal supply of the drug is restricted for use in these carefully supervised research settings. How LSD works is not fully understood, but it seems to change the levels of two chemicals that regulate brain function, serotonin and norepinephrine. Researchers have observed changes in the brain's electrical activity. Whatever the mechanism of the change, its effect is to interfere with the brain's filtering and screening process. The senses are overloaded, responding to a flood of sights, sounds, smells, and other perceptions entering the brain in unfamiliar ways. Synesthesia, a crossing of the senses, is common. Sounds may be perceived as color, or color as odor. The user can experience illusions, misinterpretations of stimuli. 
he can have true hallucinations, perceiving things that don't exist in objective reality. The user cannot control the sensations, and while they may be amusing or exhilarating, they can be frightening, and the inability to stop them may be extremely distressing. LSD's effect on the emotions varies from person to person. Even in the same person, emotional reactions vary from trip to trip and depending on the circumstances in which the drug is used. People on LSD remain conscious and they are able to reason. However, their sense of time is inaccurate and they are sometimes distracted from the reasoning process by fascination with something else. Under a large dose, users frequently report great understanding and new insights. They often speak of expanded consciousness, a sense of rebirth, escaping from stale perceptions and frustrating patterns of thought. Objective research has produced no evidence that the use of LSD produces real or lasting changes of this type, nor that it enhances creativity. Still many people have resorted to continuing use of LSD to sustain the feeling of greater understanding and insight. Studies of chronic LSD users indicate that even after the use of the drug stops, the sensory overload induced by the drug continues. This may be responsible for the observed decline in the ability to concentrate and think clearly. No one is yet able to say that chronic use of LSD is either harmful or harmless to the body. But the dangers to the mind are documented and significant, even for casual experimenters. A dangerous and not yet understood phenomenon is the flashback a recurrence of the hallucinatory experience without another dose of the drug. Because of this, the user may fear that he is losing control of his mind. The resulting depression and panic probably account for most of the suicides attributed to LSD. Trippers make themselves the guinea pigs in an uncontrollable experiment, for substances purchased as LSD may contain anything. And even when they are LSD, they are of unknown strength. With severe depression and psychosis as the risks, people who gamble with LSD and lose spend a long time trying to regain their psychic stability. On college campuses, where claims of LSD's consciousness expanding power led to the greatest interest in the drug, disillusionment with these claims and a growing awareness of the consequences have led to a decline in experimentation. But reports indicate that other young people continue to run the risks and suffer the consequences. Narcotics are drugs derived from the juice of the opium poppy and some other similar drugs. Some narcotics are prescribed by doctors for their analgesic or pain-killing properties. Any of them can be abused, but it is heroin that is preferred by narcotic addicts. People who take heroin usually have taken many other drugs previously, and they regard their first use of heroin as the final step toward a lifetime involvement with drugs. Heroin can be sniffed or absorbed through the mucous membranes. It can be injected under the skin. Most addicts mix the heroin into a liquid solution and inject it straight into a vein. Taken intravenously, it produces an initial rush an intensely pleasurable sensation of short duration, then a high, a feeling of well-being, and finally a dreamlike stupor. It reduces hunger, thirst, and the sexual drive. The user feels that it takes away his troubles. People use heroin for different reasons. They may want to hurt themselves. Its use may be an act of defiance or a cry for help. It may be the user's way of reducing what people expect of him and getting them to leave him alone. Anyone who uses narcotics regularly can develop physiological dependence, and with dependence comes the threat of withdrawal sickness. Most addicts eventually go through withdrawal because they can't get drugs, because they want to use lower doses again, or because they really want to quit. 
but most have a very persistent psychological dependence, and they frequently start looking for a shot as soon as the physical withdrawal symptoms have subsided enough for them to get out on the street. Psychological dependence on heroin is based on the drug's capacity to relieve stress. To the addict, one principal stress is the threat of withdrawal sickness, which a regular dose of constant strength will avert. But to achieve the desired mood change, the addict must gradually increase the dose. Physically and emotionally depressed, preoccupied with their habit, addicts usually get undernourished and become vulnerable to disease. From dirty needles and impure drugs, they can get hepatitis or blood infections that can damage the heart valves and the brain. If they get unexpectedly pure heroin, they can suffer from overdose. A lot of addicts wind up dead. If they are not trapped by illness or death, most addicts eventually run into trouble as a result of their efforts to support a habit which may cost them from $25 to $100 a day or even more. Wherever addicts come from, once they are hooked, they find that addiction is a career demanding nearly all of their attention, a life pattern that is extremely difficult to change. To help them change, rehabilitation programs have an enormous task. Some programs use regular oral doses of methadone, a synthetic narcotic, to eliminate the addict's craving for heroin. Though still addicted, they are more stable and can participate in their rehabilitation program without being preoccupied with getting heroin. Going back is a constant threat that can interfere with the best rehabilitation effort. To be really successful, the program must provide long-term assistance to the former addicts who need to put together entire new lifestyles, develop job skills, find new friends, learn to cope with the stresses that they may have taken heroin to reduce. Scientists hope to find a practical narcotic antagonist, a drug that neutralizes the effects of heroin. A former addict taking the antagonist would be less likely to take heroin again, knowing that it would have no effect. Better stop listening to people in this house, because what they're telling you is valid. But eliminating heroin, by whatever means, is only the first step toward building a new life. Well, it just kind of ended. Um, I don't normally like to end on a uh, <laughs> film about heroin. In fact, those are my least favorite of the drug films because they are so... They're, I mean, they're really a downer. Um, LSD films, on the other hand, awesome, so great. As many people pointed out, this seems like an ad for LSD. And I think that many of these drug films were ads uh, basically, you show them to a kid, a young person who's like, you know what, that looks awesome compared to my life, and I'm willing to take whatever risks it takes. If you're using a roller coaster as a metaphor for what a drug can be, I'm on board. So, you know, that's the that's the problem with a lot of these. In fact, some of these films actually look like they, sh they show people rolling joints, and it's like, oh, well, there you go, that t shows you how to roll a joint. How about that? Um... But, yes. Anyways, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today. I very much appreciate your eyeballs and your comments. Um, and so we're going to do this tomorrow. And somebody did some math, and it looks like next Wednesday is going to be our 200th show. 200th show. Um, and I appreciate, I would not be able to do 200 shows without you. I mean, really. I would show films for a while, but I don't think I would keep doing it if nobody was watching and commenting. So you guys are just as integral to this as me. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. Um, as always, we look inside the film can to, to guide us. So please rewind and love each other. Um, I had so many wonderful birthday wishes from you guys and from other folks. It really meant means a great deal. It really brightened my spirits, and I was like, you know what? 
I am surrounded by people that are caring and loving. And so I thank you for that. And I thank you for the community that you've created in spite of all of this. Um, so everybody take care and I will see you tomorrow. All right, bye.